Good morning, everybody. Uh, just one second while I end the music. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining. Um, this is a webinar about uh, blended learning in higher education. So more specifically, how we might approach it, how it has been approached uh, previously by a couple of different people talking um, about their experiences as well, and then how to join it all together. So I'm, uh, I'm James Dancer and I'm your host for today. So you will see me now doing some intros and then you'll see me at the end again as we uh, as we go to questions and answers. Um, so running order today, we have Mark Byrne, uh, who is a higher education account executive from Apple. Um, we have Paul Hutton, and when I asked for confirmation of Paul's official title, I got the following, so apologies in advance. Apple professional learning specialist offering strategic support to educational establishments in all phrases and sectors with vision and planning, curriculum mapping, professional development, and in-class support for teachers and teaching assistants developing creative projects. Nice grandiose title there, Paul. Um, we also have Matt Pullen, a senior lecturer from University of South Wales, and Tom Abel Green, who is the UK Education Solutions Manager for Academia. Um, so before we uh, before we get started, a um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have have been on our webinars previously and and know how this works. But just in case, for whatever reason, you don't. Um, we are going to be running a Q&A at the end, as I just said, so please make use of the chat and Q&A feature. Um, there's a couple of things to bear in mind. Uh, if you click the chat button on the right-hand side of your, your window, um, you can type comments in at the bottom. You have an option with a drop-down that's just above that to send to everybody in the room, or send to admin only, send it only to presenters. If you want to keep it private and anonymous, that's absolutely fine. Um, you also have a little bubble right next to it that currently will say chat mode. Um, you can click that button to ask a question as opposed to um, just chat in general. That puts a little red cue next to your message so we can see it at the end and we can check off whose questions we've answered and, and whose we haven't. Um, so bear in mind that if you, uh, if you forget to hit that for whatever reason, um, we can mark your chats as a question. Um, so we can do it for you. And we also have Ryan from our marketing team uh, moderating chat as well, so he can do it as well. So don't worry if you if you forget, we'll notice questions and do it anyway. It's more for our logging purposes. Um, so just before we move on, presenters, one of you has your mic unmuted and I can hear static. So if you could mute it, that would be awesome. Thank you very much. There we go. Um, good. So running order for today, Mark is going to talk to you about Apple in further and higher education. So some good uh, some good insight from, from Apple's side of things. Um, we've got Matt and Paul talking about what is blended learning and the future of teaching and learning in higher education. And I probably don't need to say this, but this is obviously an extremely poignant topic right now. And Matt and Paul have some really awesome insight into their experience, their advice, and how to put this kind of stuff into practice in your own organization. Um, and then wrapping up after that, we have Tom Abel Green uh, talking about what your next steps are and what they can be um, to apply the stuff that we speak about in this webinar to your organization in general. Um, so as I said before, if you've got questions as we're going through, please feel free to ask in line. We will probably leave them to the end, but uh, yeah, don't be afraid just to throw questions in as they come up. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark Byrne from Apple. Good morning. There, Mark. Morning, everybody. Hey, there we go. Just a quick, you can hear me, James, yeah? All good, Mark. That's great. Oh, well, hello to everybody that, um, that that's that's online today. Uh, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to to be here. So, uh, I suppose first of all, thanks ever so much for for Academia to to, to invite us across. Um, I've I've actually worked with Paul and Matt and and Tom on a number of occasions, and uh, every, every single time we've we've sat down, I've learned something new. So, re really looking forward to this this session over the the, the next hour. Especially, I suppose, as, as James said, in, in such a poignant time as well. Uh, for the next kind of seven or eight minutes, I'd, I'd just like to set the scene, if, if that's all right, from, a, from an Apple perspective. And, and I thought perhaps the, the best way to do that is, is just talk through perhaps what the last three or four months has looked like from a, an Apple perspective uh, and the, the things that are being asked of us from a, from a, a higher education and a, and a further education point of view. So I'll, I'll run through the, 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 I suppose, the top priorities that, that people are coming back to us with and, and, and what we're doing to, to look at those. And, and some of those are, are short and near term and, and some of them are longer term. But I, I thought it was worth sharing um, because there, there, there might be things that in there are, are of interest right here and now for you. But some things that might spark some longer term conversations as, as well. 
So, so the the first thing that that, that people are, are asking of us um, is very much around what what we do with with apps and workflows, and 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 this is really about redefinition and redesign and and delivery of of new tasks and workflows. And and the reason I mention it for for, for today is that we're seeing this happen time and time again um, when it when it comes to to learning, when it comes to teaching, when it comes to learning. And, and when it comes to assessment. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the topics that, that we'll go through deeply today is, is this idea of blended and, and what that means and, and how Apple and how academia and, and how things like apps can, can help to support that. So, you know, that, that's one big topic and, and, and that in its own right is a, is a very big subject, but we'd, we'd love to talk some more if people are interested in that. I think the other thing that, that people are, are asking us about, and, and this is ongoing, and I think it's a, a, a bigger and longer term thing, is, is around ongoing career skills um, for, for students. And, and we, we're doing some wonderful things, actually, with a number of universities around our app development and our app development framework and some of the education resources that we've got around that. So if, if that's of interest, it's not going to be covered today, but... And I said, it's probably not for the, the very near term, but in, in the longer term, if, if that is something of interest, then, then we'd love to, to talk some more. And then I suppose that the third point, and, and I think this is, is definitely for the here and now, is, is what, what can we do um, as September and, and beyond approaches to help people work, teach and learn from any distance? And, and I've sat on, on probably 100 different calls over the last three months uh, and, and having a look at a number of different things. So um, some is around the initial scenario planning, which I, I, I think we're, we're through that phase one of, of, of you know, what, what do we do immediately? And, and, and the, the feedback and the conversations are now are, are moving into, into phase two. So what, what do we do from September? Uh, and there's a, a whole spectrum of, of different approaches and opinions on that at the moment. And some people are pretty firm as to where they are and other people are less firm at the, the moment. But, but, but what is coming up as a, a set of consistent themes uh, are those five things that I've put up on the screen. So, you know, how, how do we get up and ready um, for mobile and blended from an IT point of view? If people aren't going to come back onto campus, um, or, or back into the cities. What what does that mean in terms of how we get things out to people, and then how do we get people set up? Um, you know, and secure delivery to home is a is a really good example of that. Uh, we've covered a, a, a couple of sessions already on this, but more than happy to to to, to do so again if if anybody hasn't had the chance to look at this. Um, but flexible, affordable finance has, has become an absolute pivotal part of this. So what, what can we do in the short term um, and what can we do to get as much into people's hands um, from, from September onwards? And, and to that, we've, we've created something called a 12-month a bridge uh, with the guys at Academia, which allows people to get Apple products and, and technologies into their hands um, for, for, for a year and, and then you can hand it back. Uh, so, you know, if, if that's of interest as, as you're trying to work through you know what what you do in the short term over the course of the next academic year then we've we're, we're building out solutions um, and flexible finance solutions to support you on that and and then point number four which is the teaching learning and well-being this is what we want to go into some detail today um, so this this is this is where we're going to pause and rest for, for for probably the next 50 minutes and and, and kind of talk that through and, and then last but not least is, I suppose, underpinning all of this is, is our value about empowering everybody and, and, and the power of assistive technologies that we've got built into our, into our products and service to enable people to do that. And, you know, Paul and I, Paul Hutton, as a, as a great example, have been on many tours and will continue to be so um, in, in terms of, of helping people to understand what is available free of charge within the, you know, within the operating environment. So once again, if that's of interest to you, then, then we'd love to, to, to talk some more uh, in, into the future. But, but let's go back to, to point number four. And I think this is probably a, 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 a good time to, to introduce Paul and, and Matt. 
but I just wanted to, to describe kind of how Paul and Matt work with, with Apple. So we have a, an education program. It's an international program, so worldwide. Uh, and, and, and that's called Apple Professional Learning. And, and this is a, a set of programs and services that, that we take out, um, as I said, on an international basis to, 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 to support people on a, on a, on a local basis. And, and within that, we've got a team of people called Apple Professional Learning Specialists. So these people know local context. They also understand, um, you know, kind of ed education uh, from, from top to bottom. They're absolute specialists in, in what they do. But they're, they're also specialists in terms of understanding what Apple can do to, to support from that perspective as well. So they kind of merge those, merge those three things together. Um, and as I said, really, really privileged to, to have worked with, with both Paul, Matt, and, and also Tom in, in the past. And, and, and I'd like now to, to hand you over to Paul and Matt, that are both Apple professional learning specialists, to talk around this really important area of, of teaching, learning from a, from a blended point of view. So Paul, Matt, if I can hand the mic over to you and uh, look forward to learning some more. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, <laughs> humbling as always to, uh, to hear you uh, introducing us. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I, I do apologize for the really long bio that James gave about me. <laughs> I thought everybody was going to do a kind of a, a paragraph, not a single sentence. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, it is a delight to be here. Um, and uh, personally, it's also a real delight to be uh, in a virtual space with Matt Pullen, um, somebody I admire greatly. We became ADEs in the same year. Back in 2013, yeah. Absolutely, the best class ever. Best class ever. So yes, a absolute pleasure to be to be here with you, Paul, and, and to talk about these things. I think, um, as as Mark's alluded to there, we've, we've both worked um, with uh, higher education. Um, I currently still work in higher education as well um, at the University of South Wales. Um, and, and I think, you know, in the next, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes, I think we're, we're going to just try to share some of our insights into what blended learning could look like, uh, not necessarily what it has looked like in the past. I think there are opportunities now to, to see blended learning in a different way. And, and I'm really looking forward to kind of uh, delving into that deeper with you. And uh, the format of, of how we're gonna approach this really is, is a conversation between myself and Paul. Um, so please do ask questions as, as we go. If there's anything you want us to develop further, um, or if you have any points that you'd love to raise um, that, that we can then discuss as well. Um, I think that's that's the real benefit of this conversation around what blended learning could look like in the future. Absolutely. So I, I guess, without further ado, we seem to have the longest, in fact, it's probably going to take about 40 minutes for us just to say the actual title of what we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> but it is, in a way, it, what we're looking at is, is almost two questions in one, but they are, are intrinsically interlinked. So what is blended learning? And what is the future of teaching and learning in higher education? So, um, Matt, as a, as a current lecturer, um, for you, what, what is blended learning? I think, I think for me coming into to higher education from being a secondary school teacher for 12 years, um, blended learning was always kind of approached as we don't have our students with us all the time as we do in, in uh, secondary education, primary education, um, you know, where they sit in front of us from nine till three, or if they're not in our class, they're in the building somewhere. Uh, so blended learning was always kind of that, well, you know, the students come and go, they, they're in for lectures and then they might be in the library and then they might be somewhere else. And how are they going to operate between that face to face environment and that non face to face environment? And, and obviously we, we talk there about the use of, of virtual learning environments or online resources. Um, I think when I first started, the, the approach there was was not necessarily blended it was very much this is what we do in the class and then i'll give you access to that stuff outside of the class and there'll be a reading list where i'll say it would be great if you went and, and did some deeper reading around this um and, and that's all very well obviously if you've got students that are self-motivated to go and do that additional work um so what i certainly saw within our course was that move towards 
directed study to, to facilitating distance-based blended learning approaches. We've done this in the classroom. We want you to go away and, and develop this as a group. And then we want you to come back next week and tell us what you've done. So we were merging the face-to-face -face and the non-face-to-face -face time. I still don't think we necessarily saw the huge advantages that technology offers in terms of how can students engage in that environment. And I think probably the last year or so, we started to see students really take up the collaborative spaces that technology offers when they're not in the building, but they also can't meet up in, a, in another building because of time pressures, family pressures, work pressures, all of those other things. And they started to think, well, actually, we've got this opportunity to collaborate on something, even if we're not in the same place at the same time. So I think that's where we started to see blended learning really take off from what was quite uh, restricted to something which actually changed how they can access learning. And I know we'll we'll come on to that a little bit later as well in terms of the future. So. Paul, you are muted, I think. Yeah, I can't hear you, Paul. Apologies, everyone. I, I politely muted my mic there. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I was wondering almost when, when we were thinking about what is blended learning, I was almost tempted to think, but what is it not? What is not blended learning? Uh, and trying to separate out, are there, are there specific things that just wouldn't fit into a blended learning model? Um, and that, that's why, in a way, I, I just found it easier to to just almost visualize what are the elements that we, we would anticipate seeing. And you've alluded to all of these already. The idea of that, that flexibility, I think, is the key at the center of blended learning. So blended, if it's not blended learning, then it is it's inflexible and it is in one place. So immediately that takes time and place out of the equation. Um, because all I'm thinking about is what are the advantages of having that flexibility, first and foremost, in time and place. Uh, and then the idea of path, that ultimately you will still have to you know, hand in assignments, you'll still have to take part in seminars, workshops and lab work, for example. But you have a choice over the path you take. Not that it's, it's a very linear process, it's much more um, organic and that you know you have certain requirements to meet, but you choose your own pathway through it. So it could I think, be. Sorry, sorry, Paul, just to jump in there on that one, because because what I what I find really interesting about that concept is is you can you can almost feel constrained by a learning pathway. You you choose a, a course to take at university, um, and and that's the course you take. And that, I remember my time in university, we we had the option to just take you know additional credit options um, i don't even think they they actually played into the the degree classification but they were on offer that you could you know if you, if you fancy doing something when i did something on marketing i was doing a pe uh, degree and i chose to do something on marketing so, so it just looks interesting um and i love it and i love it to this day and actually i think you know if i had my time over again maybe i, I would have gone down that route because I, I like the whole idea of design i like all of that and I think what blended learning offers you is that opportunity to take those different pathways because the stuff is available online and it might not necessarily always be, uh, you know, the, the choice that you took when you turned 18 or your, when you chose to go to university. But I think what you can offer in a blended learning approach is, is these kind of pathways where people can, can branch off and start to think, you know, this might not be my future career for the rest of my life because I've had an opportunity to have a look at something else as well. And do you know what, in the future, and again, I don't wanna give away what we're gonna talk about later, but maybe that's where jobs start to merge together. Maybe actually the role of a teacher sometimes is someone who can do marketing, because certainly I know for me in higher education, one of my jobs is to, to do recruitment and retention, and we do that through marketing. And having that, that three hour session on marketing back in, I don't even wanna say when it was, I was in university, has actually just given me that little bit of insight to be able to understand what the world of marketing might look like. I'm not saying I'm an expert in any way, but it's just opened your eyes to something. Mm, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> coincidentally, I was uh, listening to a, a webinar the other day by Nisai and one of the lecturers there from Ontario in Canada, uh, Todd Cunningham, 
he said that maybe with the whole emphasis now on blended learning and and on how we have it is our responsibility a to preserve the well-being of our students in higher education first and foremost but that he said uh, and i've got literally the quote here that he said we should view our role not as lecturers and professors and researchers but more about orchestrators of learning now and it's that idea of facilitating you know orchestrating something instead of absolutely controlling it you are simply orchestrating a learning process that you have got you know, as a conductor of an orchestra you have oversight of everybody and everything but it, it was just it was an interesting an interesting idea orchestrators of learning and jesse woolly wilson on another webinar said that uh, the role of uh, educators is to increase the velocity of learning interesting increase the velocity of learning so and you and i were talking about bloom's taxonomy earlier on but let's not yeah. go there yet okay <laughs> um okay so really we're thinking about blended learning being about flexible flexible in terms of time flexible in terms of place flexible in terms of you know, your pathway and flexible in terms of pace. Um, I'm just thinking that you're closer to the students than, than I am. It's been three and three years since I've supported higher education directly. But the, the idea of pace as well for students, they are fitting their coursework into uh, their part-time jobs. Their study is, candidly, sometimes for students, study is not the reason they go to university. I know it should I think be. Yeah, I think I think, um, and if, if I say specifically to the course I teach on, so because I teach um, undergraduate teacher education, so future future teachers coming through, what we see is a, is a real mix of students that uh, have come straight from the education system, so they've gone through uh, secondary, further education, into higher education, but we also see quite a lot of, of mature students coming back to us later on in their lives because they want to start a career after having had a family. Um, and so with that, it brings alternative pressures. With our younger mm. students, we know that they've all got part-time jobs. They tend to finish with us and go straight to a job and then work there for most of the evening. With our mature students, they go home and they look after their family until eight, nine o'clock at night. So where the expectation traditionally from us is this is a full-time course and you should be studying outside of, you know, the, the reality is, majority can't study until nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night because of other work commitments. And, and that's something that we have to start to consider. Also, traditionally, we start lectures in the morning, the same time as you would traditionally start a job. Um, and yes, you know, if they, for our students, they're going into the, the workplace of teaching and that is when their job would start. But that's not necessarily to say we have to train them and put additional pressure on the fact that you have to fight through traffic to get into university for those times as well so we're starting to think about you know what what and when is it that that works best for our students to teach because we want them to be the best students we don't want to hamper them with additional pressures of time additional pressures of, of battling traffic paying mm -hmm. for parking all of those sorts of things um, we want them to benefit from the course graduates that they can be um, it's not three years of training for how to get up early in the morning and, and how to work late into the night you know, that's that's not what it's about so it's quite interesting to sort of think about how we can think about blended learning as the opportunity to just give people more breathing space to absorb the learning um, I, I suppose you you said about that velocity of uh, of learning uh, it's the same sort of thing isn't it we don't all learn because i attended the lecture at nine o'clock in the morning and, and you spoke to me for an hour and i it, i've soaked it all up right some people just need time to reflect and mm -hmm. in fact most people need time to reflect and we need to give them the time and, and the space to breathe to actually have reflection time so that they can think about the concepts and not just regurgitate the concepts for me university is all about critical thinking it's all about challenge and I say this to my students all the time, challenge me. I, I'm not right in everything. And most things I'm right, but not everything. There are there are some chinks. But challenge it, because in challenging it, you're having to engage with the process. So having that opportunity for students to actually reflect and think and then come back with a, an argument, a discussion, 
actually then you know we, we're developing better students and we don't get that if we cram it all into certain time place path and, and pace that that made me think of a, a one of those fundamental uh ting moments at the University of Westminster. Academia supported uh, the University of Westminster doing the largest deployment of iPad uh, at that point in time, you know, three and a half thousand devices. So every student received an iPad on, on entry and kept it all the way through their course of study. Uh, and one of the lecturers in biomedical science uh, said that you know, he's normally got 180 students in a lecture uh, and he's always, always, always been trying to find a way of engaging with the students in a way that you've been talking about, allowing them time to reflect. And for him, there was always this tension that you've got the students for two hours and you feel obliged to impart as much as you can in that two hour lecture, cram their heads and they say, now off you go. Uh, and he's always felt that that tension that it is largely one way traffic simply because of the constraints of, of, of the course. So when the students were given their iPad, you know, academia supported them and said, look, here are a core of resources and that would be really useful in terms of on-site, off-site learning uh, and continuing the, the, the learning beyond the room. And one of them was Padlet, which is just a, an online discussion board. Now they still use Blackboard and everything else. This was just something light and easy. And he was talking about um, something to do with biomedical science. I'm not going to embarrass myself by, by trying to say it. Uh, it had lots of letters. And on the Padlet board, students are just pinging messages. And he's always aware of the students at the back of the room. You know, how engaged are they? Because they are a further 100 feet away from the learning, from, from the teaching process. And because students can publish at any time in the session or after the session, he found that really, really useful. And he was thinking, I'm not sure I've made this point particularly clear. Uh, so one of the students on the Padlet boards put, I'm not quite sure about this out the other. And another student put, can I ask why proteinuria is more common in girls? So they've listened, they've absorbed, they've reflected. And then later on that evening, they posted up this question they suddenly had. And for him, he said that was profound because without the access to technology, that would not have happened. Yeah, and I think that's that's absolutely critical. I mean, it, within our own team yesterday, we were having a discussion about some of the students on one of our courses who, it just so happens that the, the majority of the students in, in the group are introverts. And the discussion was around engagement. Uh, and, and it soon moved to don't don't confuse engagement with introvert behavior because introverts just don't necessarily want to engage in the way that you might think engagement is measured. Uh, and again, exactly the same thing. Giving them the technology in the classroom allows them to have a voice without having to have a voice. They don't have to shout something out loud to be heard and to be considered engaged. Um, and, and and be an influence in that situation by giving them the tool and and you know you mentioned padlet there's there's a million other tools mm. that you can use but by giving them the device it allows them to have the voice so we're making learning much more accessible to all students so we're not just isolating it to the few who have a loud voice and have an opinion and, and are brave enough or maybe extrovert enough to put their hand up and share that with the masses and I think you know exact, exactly to that point, that's why technology in this situation allows people to take time to reflect, take time to absorb, um, understand what's been discussed. But also I think in your example there, it also proves that the expert doesn't have to be the person at the front of the room, or at least the support doesn't need to be the person at the front of the room. If I pose a question later in the day and my lecturer isn't on Padlet or whatever uh, talk you know, group we're having, somebody else who did understand can step forward and, and pose their rationale for the, for the discussion. I'm not even going to broach the conversation that you mentioned in because I wouldn't even be able to say the term that you used that was <laughs> used. Um, but but somebody else can do that. And then all of a sudden that changes what education looks like, right? We talk about Vygotsky's zones of proximal development. It, it is about learning from each other. And that whole conversation could go in a different way completely to what the lecturer was intending it to go to. And that's new thinking. 
And that's really what we're about in higher education, new thinking, new approaches, new directions. And that doesn't always happen because it comes from one person stood at the front. It comes because there's a collective voice asking questions, posing questions, taking it in different directions, questioning what that initial thought process might have been, not challenging the, the lecturer's position or standing, but challenging it in a way to say, yeah, but could it also mean this? And could we take it in this direction? And how might this new thinking solve this new problem that we've got? It's interesting because everything, uh, everything you and I have been talking about is largely focusing on the, the flexibility of blended learning and and the flexibility of being able to rotate the order that you do things and having much more control over time. Now, for students, you you mentioned your know, students who are mature students have families and and other responsibilities. There are plenty of advantages we've highlighted about blended learning and the benefits for students. What about the benefit for lecturers? So that's. That's also a very interesting one. We we have for some time talked a lot about co-teaching, co-delivery of, of sessions where the expertise that I have might cross over with the expertise someone else has. Now, again, I, I'll talk about this on a very personal level to what, what I deliver. So I deliver the science element of primary school education. I also deliver the technology enhanced element of primary school education. Now on my own, science doesn't sit as a separate entity. Um, we know that science, kind of crosses over to maths and crosses over to PE and crosses over to everything. Yeah, I teach it in isolation. And that's predominantly because of traditional structures of how schools work, right? Or, or how higher education works. I sit in my own silo because I teach during that time slot. And what we see now with blended learning is the opportunity to actually co-deliver. Because if I'm not necessarily teaching everything face to face, if I've got the opportunity to record something with a colleague, then all of a sudden I freed up that time. If I do some um, asynchronous teaching, then actually I'm not physically teaching in that time slot, which then frees me up to maybe do some co-teaching with a colleague in a different time slot, or I might record something asynchronously with a colleague. And you know, there's just opportunities to then start to think differently about how do we, if we if we're so big on talking to students about cross-disciplinary, you know, study, well, let's actually model that. Let's actually talk about that my skill set doesn't necessarily need to be in isolation here it can actually be utilized in a different place that's also going to benefit the lecturers to develop their thinking because they're working in partnership and ultimately these are the skills that we're saying are useful for, for our future graduates as they go into the workplace how do we work with other people so the technology is also allowing us to start to model different approaches to learning you know for instance we're on a webinar now and we are hundreds of miles apart and we're sharing thoughts sharing processes the experts don't need to be in the room anymore mm. good point and well presented so uh, thank you that that's really really interesting and i think it all in at the core of this at the core of everything we're talking about um you know, Mark alluded to it at the beginning, we're kind of alluding to it now, but blended learning cannot exist really without technology. And there is a huge implication there, not just technology, but robust technology at, in, in all places and spaces that we need robust technology so that we can have students on site with hundreds of devices and bearing in mind that most students if you've got a, a, a thousand students on campus you will probably have three thousand devices so you know, i'm thinking about the the importance of making sure your infrastructure and i know james dancer has his two c's for a uh, talk about network uh, his coverage and capacity um, and just making sure that that robustness is also mirrored in the spaces where students will be off campus so that they have got robust access to technology at home. And that sometimes is not the case. Yeah. That in their in their rented apartments, for example, it could be that it's advertised as Wi-Fi, but they are sharing the bandwidth with you know, dozens of other people and, and video webinars just cannot happen. So yeah. it, it is it is whilst it's enabling, we also need to be mindful of of the importance of the robustness of that infrastructure. Yeah, and I think you're also alluding there to, to accessibility and accessibility in its, in its widest sense, right? Um, we need to make sure that everyone has access to these things. But also in the very delivery that what we do, we're providing access. We've already talked about 
time and place and, and space for, for our learners in terms of access. But also that comes down to the point of, and I've seen this with my own son's learning, and now he's 11, so it's not higher education, um, but, but the concept is the same. The fact that the, the, the resources, the provision he's being provided with now in, in this blended learning space that he's going through is actually being designed for the, for the margins, okay? And, and I was listening to a talk yesterday, so the kind of concept of the margin planning is something which is, is really, really important. If you plan for the for the for the average, if you plan for that person that sits in the middle, and and I will go a little bit academic here, Paul, and and highlight a book. So Todd Rose, um, the end of average, a fantastic read. It just alludes to the fact that when you plan for the average, you actually plan for nobody because average doesn't exist. Okay, and there's a great analogy about, or it's not even an analogy; it's a truth about uh, the American Air Force planning for uh, a cockpit design for the average person in America and actually what they found was lots of people were dying because nobody fit in the cockpit <laughs> and so actually what happened was they then had to personalize the design so that it could be adapted to anybody and in doing that they made it more accessible to everybody and reduced deaths and that is now why we have adjustable seats in our cars and seat belts that adjust that aren't just fixed because if you did that you limit the amount of people that can access it now if you put that to education by by planning for everybody and technology is a way that you can plan for everybody because not everybody has the ability to access it at the same time but then even if we go into the full-on accessibility which i know you you have a lot more knowledge on than me just by having things on the device like speak selection and screen reader and, and all of those things i've now just planned that all of my resources can be accessed by everybody and by planning and designing the learning to be accessible to all, it means it's accessible to all. If I plan for it to be accessed by the average, I then also have to account for those people that don't have those, uh, you know, don't have additional needs, which actually means my workload's just gone up. So actually, when you plan in the first case to accommodate everybody, you actually save yourself time, and it benefits the masses as well. And I'm sure you've got you know additional things to talk about that because it's really really important that we personalise learning to to everybody. And you know I will say it again, technology is the way to personalise the learning. Absolutely, and and I know that uh, Mark Byrne and I have, have have supported many higher education spaces uh, talking about accessibility, and it 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 is simply the ability to access learning. Uh, which is so simple and profound. And it does require, like you've said, it does require a little bit more thought about, are my resources flexible? Can they? Can the, uh, a student highlight text and have it spoken back to them? Um, can they simply go to a, a, a an article online, for example, and students sometimes with the best of intentions, they get distracted and features like reader view in safari where you can go to an article on a website and remove all of the distracting content with the simple press of a button so many students at westminster said that is such a powerful tool because it enables me to access the information you know that if, think, if it weren't there i'd be off looking at something else yeah i think it's quite interesting i've, I've got a student in in my uh, course at the moment who is uh she's partially sighted in one eye and totally blind in the other eye um, and she was waiting she came to me quite shyly but asked me uh, for some help because she was struggling to see my presentation in the room um, which is absolutely fine and I said yeah but you've got an iPad right let me share my let me share my uh, presentation to your iPad you don't need to look at the, at the front you can look at it there and she said oh that's yeah that that would that would be helpful for now. I'm still waiting for my specialist devices to enable me to be able to see things clearly. So she was waiting for, I, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I would assume because the solution that I gave her was to change the tint on the iPad so she could see things easier. So she was waiting for something that had been designed specifically for her at a cost of thousands of pounds. Um, what we did was we shared the presentation to her I went to accessibility features and switched it on on her device. She now had the same device as other people in the room. So she wasn't isolated. She didn't look any different, um, but it solved her problem. So she was able to learn. I then two weeks later uh, did a just a workshop with some students on a different course about accessibility and talked about the, the color tints and, and the color inverts and those sorts of things. 
and there was one student in the room who said oh my word why wasn't this around when i was in school because <laughs> my teacher always used to have to say who's got the color tints now and he he just felt embarrassed by it and he felt that that was a block to his learning and at that point then he was like education's just now become accessible to me again not from the point of actually being able to access it but he didn't feel like he was that strange outlier in the classroom who had to have the color tint paper uh, given to him so that he could access something and i think there's something there in terms of just our health and well-being um, and and you know our mental uh, you know capacity to to want to be in a learning environment as well absolutely uh, i know mark byrne has this lovely phrase about accessibility that it is essential <laughs> uh, essential to some valuable for all uh, and uh, yes, absolutely. And and it's so encouraging when we hear that technology and that blended learning approach, it's a real leveler in in the in you know, in a classroom or in a in a learning environment. So I'm just thinking from from your point of view, um I I guess uh, at the University of South Wales, um and I'm thinking back to my support for Westminster and when I was a a senior lecturer at Anglia Polytechnic University many moons ago um for you what is the future of teaching and learning in higher education i think i think what we're seeing now is is a shift um towards uh, and this is not my phrase this is a phrase from a, a webinar i attended recently i think we're moving to a people age um, we've gone through the industrial age we've gone through uh the the information age i think we're moving to a people age and the reason that that came up in the webinar um, and i've really been thinking about this a lot recently is as we start to see machine learning taking over certain areas of, of uh, industry and you know, we've got lots of robots that do things for us the panic in lots of people is that they're taking over and there'll be no jobs for anyone and actually what what i've kind of resonated with as a follow-up to that is if we now start to think about the value of people and we invest in that personalized approach so what is it that i can offer that enhances the world around me i no longer have to do the the mundane routine someone else can or something else can do that so so now let, let's actually start to look now at what we offer as individuals as humans and again it goes back to that personalized approach what is it that makes me strong and when we then look at that in terms of this idea of collaboration how do i work with other people what are my strengths and how can i support you what is it that i offer and what can i develop individually as a person and i think if education starts to bring that out in people, if people start to think about what is it that I actually have this fundamental strength at and how do I support others, technology can link me to those people quite easily. And technology will enable me to develop those skills and share those skills with other people. We we have seen in the last three months that technology opens the world to, to experts everywhere. Okay, And now all of a sudden, I can look to those people to develop. And I think what we need is a system that really starts to take away the onus on the the mundane robotic things and starts to look at humans as as the the creators of new things mm -hmm. because i think there's a chance here uh certainly when you're looking at how do we solve this problem of a pandemic the, the we need people that can adapt very very quickly and solve new problems and think in a way which is not about this is how we've always done it but this is what we could do differently. Um, and I think what you see a lot, and, and I think this is probably the benefit of me working in higher education, but training primary school teachers, is I spend also a lot of time in a primary school. And that is the thinking that happens at the, that young tender age, four to seven year olds. The, the blue sky thinking that the anything is possible. They don't, they're not stuck by the, I was taught this and this has kind of told me that that's not possible. They just think, completely open and i think maybe there's a chance now to bring that level of thinking into into higher education to free people to start to think differently and solve the world's problems in creative ways and and you know we talk about creativity we, we were talking earlier about bloom's taxonomy fully understanding what bloom's taxonomy means and what that pinnacle of creativity actually is it's not the art it's not drawing pictures and, and acting that is it's valuable but that is not all that creativity is creativity is is solving solving problems and and thinking with the knowledge i have what can i do with it um, and i love how technology unleashes that because it connects me with the world of, of all of that content that allows me to express myself in a, in a in a way that i can share with others
Absolutely. I, 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 we've both talked um, and had many conversations about Bloom's taxonomy. And, and when I present, I, I invariably do show Bloom's taxonomy because anybody in as an educator in any particular discipline, you know about Bloom's taxonomy and, and it's normally a pyramid and there's creation at the top and remembering. And, and that's what our, uh, our assessment systems are built on, simply remembering. And if you're lucky, you might even move to phase two, which is understanding. But the yeah. idea of creation at the top, which is that's what we're, we're aiming for. Uh, and we so rarely get there due to constraints of time. Uh, and and also to be able to create, you need to go through that, that what you've said there about curiosity, that that open ended thinking. Well, why? Um, that is really so important. And I often use the, the Bloom's taxonomy and then simply invert the pyramid. So you still have those phases. It's just we're placing far greater emphasis now. And I think things like COVID have shown us this, that we do need to be creators and creative. We can't just, just absorb what we've been given and, and take it as valid and true. So, which is what I think the creative the process the creative process is linked up to that reflection time, isn't it? So if I therefore create stuff that can be accessed anytime, anywhere, any place, and the students have a device which allows them to be creative with that new knowledge, but access it in a time that works for them, we're not all creative at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, right? That's just not when we're creative. So imagine if that's when your timetable lecture is, you might miss that opportunity to suddenly develop something further. If I've got access to that learning at a different time and access to a tool that enables me to make a video, make a podcast, make a book, make a whatever it might be, to share with the world my thoughts, my opinions, it can develop ideas. And again, we go back to Vygotsky's Stones of Proximal Development. If I'm putting that stuff out there, I'm not saying it's fact, I'm saying it's an idea and someone else might pick up that idea and take it somewhere else and take it somewhere else. And that's progress. Progress isn't, I write an essay based on what my lecturer told me, based on some books that were written 20 years ago, regurgitate it and you give me a grade. That's that's just not enough anymore. It's not changing the world, it's just ticking a box. And, and I think we owe more to our students in, in higher education and the world at large to, to be change makers or, or creators of change or whatever term you want to call it, but, but make a difference. Uh, orchestrators of learning. Yeah. Orchestrators uh, of learning. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to just briskly move past this because I'm I, you and I could, could chat till the cows came home. Um, we did warn them this. Uh, you know, <laughs> and this, this, this is particularly um, poignant at the moment with COVID that there is something called the summer slide. Uh, there's been a lot of research done on it. Uh, this is, the concern that educational spaces have about the, the the degradation of learning over the summer period, bearing in mind that this is very binary and that it's only measuring attainment in reading, writing, spelling and maths. Uh, but in a way, it's, it's what you've been saying that actually that summer slide, you think that could be, forget the idea of the, the, the downturn in, in, in the summer, you think this could actually be a day. And that actually within a day, students are focusing on core skills and then it kind of dies down and rises up again. But it is interesting just thinking about the, the blended learning approach and how it could help to soften those dips. And, and maybe it, it, that's where the creativity comes in, that it's not the functional reading, writing and, and the, the mathematical computation. It's saying, okay, now that you have that core of information, do something with it, be creative, create something new that helps you reflect on your own learning because it's not just passive, here's the information. You have a responsibility as a learner to look at it and, and, and critique it, evaluate it. And simply by talking something out in a podcast, making a video about, for example, if you're on a course on life sciences and acupuncture, we'll make a video about the, the different median zones and everything else. But because you create it, then it helps you reflect, do I genuinely understand it or not? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna kind of prove two points in one here. So this is, this is a, book, um, a book review in, a, in the art of a sketch note that I've done. Um, and it's, I'll talk about, 
what it is and then I'll talk about why I've done it in this way. So uh, it's about motivation. It's from a book called uh, Drive by Daniel Pink. It talks about the progression of how what motivates us as human beings. We started out as being motivated by the desire to survive and we needed food. So our simple motivation was survival. That was it. As we then develop in our complex societies, we can't just grab any food. We have to start to live with other people. So I can't just take my neighbor's food because that's their food. So in order to develop, we we have this kind of reward and punishment. If I do something good, I'll get rewarded. If I do something bad, like steal someone else's food, I'll get punished. So therefore, I'm now motivated by you know, I don't want to get punished, but I also think that if if I make more food and sell it to my my neighbour, then I'll get paid for it. That's good. So I'll do more of that. So we're then motivated in this way, and that's kind of motivation too. And that's kind of stuck with us for hundreds of years. Um, Taylor in the early 1900s um, decided to utilise this style of motivation, which is what we see in workplaces and schools, which is this idea that we reward what we want more of and we punish what we want less of. Um, and that's the kind of industrial revolution style of come in, work all day and we'll give you some money for it. And if you do something wrong, we'll sack you. Um, and that's become the norm. Um, and then the kind of pivoting bit at the end, the, the little diagram I've got there is humans are essentially just big horses. We just, it's the carrot and stick. You know, we, we feed them to get them to do what we want and we punish them if, if they do something that we don't want them to do. And then this has kind of moved on to this concept of motivation three, which is actually when we want to achieve something our human nature is that we want to work with others we want to get better at things um just the, the innate desire to to become better individuals and you've definitely seen that in the last three months children that haven't been in school have still learned at home they might not have learned the curriculum and this kind of alludes back to what you said before uh, about that dip they still learned something and why did they learn even though they weren't in school? Well, because it was something that interested them. It was something which resonated with their desire to get better. It's because they worked with parents in a different scenario. Lots of children have been cooking, lots of children have been learning how to make clothes, to be artists, to be doing something that maybe school, college, university didn't give them time for because of the constraints of a curriculum. So as we move to this motivation three, what are our desires in order to get better? Um, and we move away from this element of I only do it because I'm getting paid for it to actually I do it because I love it. So I'll, I'll then sort of allude to this kind of picture. Why is this a picture? And it goes back to what you said before. Actually, I'm going to remember this because I created it. Hmm. And I could have written all of that down on a slide. Um, and I could have given you bullet points. First, we did this. First, second, we did that. It's not going to be memorable because actually the science would say that the concept of dual coding and, and the process of how we learn things is a mixture of words and pictures. And the fact that I've had to engage in, in showing this in a pictorial way means I'm going to remember it. It also means the chances are you might remember it more because it's pictorial. And our brain is processing not just the words that I'm saying, but the pictures that I've used. And in fact, probably the thing you'll remember the most is the guy sitting on the back of a bigger guy with a carrot over his head because it symbolizes the concept of humans as big horses. So what I've had to do is take words and turn it into pictures, and that's the creative approach. Now, I use this approach with my students in university. Don't sit in my lecture and write down what I've said. Don't use um, a laptop and type out what I've said, because all you're doing is taking my words and putting it uh, um, onto paper in exactly the same form. But take the pencil and draw what I'm saying because your brain is engaging in the process and you're having to make sense of it at the point of coding. And we don't have time to go into this and I could bore <laughs> you for, for hours on the science behind it, but the creative process of coding our learning is actually how we will remember it better um, and have that memory recall. Absolutely, and, and just for the record, I'd like to say that is the finest picture of a carrot I have seen in many, many days. Thank you very much. I got a, a C grade at GCSE Art. <laughs> um, so I think this is this slide here is really just a summary slide of of everything that you and I have been talking about. I'm, I'm, uh, was it Mark Twain who said, "I never let education stand and get in the way of my learning"? Um, I would have uh, known. Did he play for Liverpool? Who's Liverpool? <laughs> This conversation is going nowhere. Uh, but I think uh, we, in a way, this is a summary slide, basically showing that you know, we've talked about 
the, the whole point of this blendedness. What is blended? Everything is blended. Time, space, pace, it's all blended, it's all flexible. Um, this idea of asynchronous learning, that we're not all learning at the same time, in the same space. And uh, with what you've been saying about, don't just listen to me and write it down. I want you to question me. I want you to be curious. I want you to say, how do we know that that's valid and true? Um, and are there any counter arguments for what you've just said? And and almost f this is where for the well, we're talking briefly about the, the benefit for the lecturers. I think the benefit for the lecturers is the shift of ownership of learning that, you know, candidly, lecturers are there because they are at the pinnacle of knowledge. They have a, a profound understanding sometimes of niche areas and, 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 with, and that is invaluable. It's the responsibility of the student to take to, to benefit from that and make what the lecturer has imparted in whichever medium and format to take of that and make something new. I will also add to that, though, uh, um, and a slight caveat. Um, and I heard this yesterday, so this isn't my quote, um, but I will take all credit if people want to offer it to me. Um, we are now in a post COVID world, all first year teachers because this is all new um, and the the whatever the new norm is going to be and i don't like that term but whatever it's going to be no one's experienced it before mm. so therefore we're all first year teachers and and that means we can all learn from each other so that expert in the room isn't necessarily the person at the front absolutely um and, so, and you do you find people now catching themselves saying when things go back to no, uh, there is yeah. no there is no normal Normal no, is no historical. Don't, don't be in a rush to want to go back to the way things were, because I think history has proved that it wasn't perfect. So if we've got a chance to change it, let's take that chance now. Yes, and somebody said history repeats itself. It has to. No one listens. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I, I think for me, the, 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 the at, right at the heart of this flexibility of teaching and learning, the benefit is it's what um, uh, Bill Rogers put in in his book, Cracking the Hard Class. It, it's not the immediacy; it's the inevitability. It's not the immediacy of a sanction punishment or the immediacy of learning. It is the inevitability that it is going to happen, and, and that's why on the right hand side we've got those graphics just showing that. Uh, simply by moving towards a more blended approach. We have students engaged before, during, and after learning sessions, whatever they may be. Uh, and so we're removing all of that redness. And uh, the benefit actually there is also for the lecturers that we have, uh, that they are able to play to their real strengths as well. So Matt, it has been an absolute pleasure having our little uh, 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 far side chat or far slide chat. Um, so thank you from uh, from uh, the, the heart of uh, South Wales. And I think without further ado, we hand over to, um, to Tom. Uh, on the screen, everyone, you'll get these slides anyway, but there are some really useful references uh, as we find ourselves approaching the weekend with absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> Uh, well, it's really hard to follow that, isn't it? To be, <laughs> to be fair. So, a, a hugely engaging, um, always fascinating um, to absolutely uh, learn and and just to kind of uh, to I, I guess to listen to 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 the experts that you you absolutely are. And, and also, thank you to Mark at the beginning. I think that the reality, from my perspective, is um, is what what kind of what do we do next, and what are the next steps that we have. From um, from academia's point of view, but also from a customer perspective, what are those things that we need to be looking at? Um, and so for that, uh, there's kind of a, a brief list that we've got, and and these are kind of a, an overview and, and something that we can absolutely follow up on. And um, Mark uh, from Apple at the very beginning of the webinar talked about, um, you know, the, the the education program that is um, that is fantastic from Apple, and it has many different strands, and one of those is the Apple Professional Learning Program, of which uh, obviously Paul and Matt are. Um, and one of the things that, that academia is able to do to support its customers is look at what we uh, 
can do outside of just supplying hardware and that is things like strategic leadership and planning and also leadership seminars around supporting teaching and learning through the use of technology um, and these are sessions and workshops that that come with no charge to our customers um, and they're supported um, by people like Paul and Matt um, who have absolute experience and expertise from a, a, a teaching perspective and from our perspective we offer the operational support uh, and the strategic planning support around kind of what those next steps look like. Um, and I think um, that we have, uh, well, I know that we have delivered in excess of nearly sort of 80 to 90 of these, and we can do these virtually. And I don't think Paul and I, or Matt and I, who, who have done many, have ever done one that is exactly the same. And, and what that highlights is that whilst there is an end measurement of success for each customer, each journey has to be different or is different. And we need to be, make sure that that, that bespoke solution suits um, the, the end user. Uh, and that, that goes from, from staff across to, to students as well. Um, and another program that Apple has in the education space is, is what we call regional training centers. Um, and Ma, uh, Matt, sorry, part of the University of South Wales, they are actually uh, a regional training center. And Matt spends a lot of time supporting not only uh, other teachers that are in his own institution, but across across um, Wales uh, from an RTC perspective. And also um, it gives great insight into kind of the, the modern and very current um, pedagogical ways of supporting through the use of technology. And it's, it's, it's important that we actually lean on those experts and we talk about it. And, and somebody said, how do you define an expert? And I think it's about experience. It's about those who have gone down that journey um, and can help support kind of the next steps that might be there. Reimagining uh, the way uh, that traditional tasks and workflow happen, I think uh, Matt alluded to this at the end of that, that great piece that they were talking about, is actually history shows that, that it wasn't perfect before. And actually there are um, some, some huge impacts that COVID has had on our life very recently, um, and none of them are actually great. But there, is, uh, there are some positives. And for me, we actually have never been closer to being able to make changes in the way that the education um, space looks and the way that we can support our learners and the way that we can support um, staff and that well-being, um, the blended learning approach. I mean, the, the, there's just an abundance of, of areas that we could look at. But what's important to remember is that um, to be able to do some of this and, and look at these types of learning uh, and these kind of projects and strategies is that we have to have a mindset change. And the mindset change is really very simple. If we always do uh, what we've always done, then we're always going to get what we've always got. And I know Matt and Paul talk about that um, a lot as well. And so with that in mind, um, if we can look at those mindset changes and we can look at the way things are delivered and the way that workflows happen, then that blended learning approach and the way that we teach um, can be supported in a very different way to the traditional ways that technology has always been bought, which is let's buy, buy the, the technology and then let's shape the strategy towards it, which which actually is probably not the best way of doing things. Um, and one of the things that, that Paul mentioned around, um, like the, the excitement from students at University of Westminster, um, just to highlight that project, there was a, an enormous number of devices that went into a faculty. Um, we're, we're talking in the thousands. And one of the um, real success points or measurements of success for me isn't the quantity of devices but it taps into um, how students were able to use the online learning platform at a time that absolutely suited them. And actually the content was accessed over a million times in that first year by those thousands of students, but it was accessed a million times outside of the nine to five. And this absolutely goes back to those points that Paul, uh, Mark and, and, and Matt were, were, were kind of talking about is why should I learn at a specific time. Now, obviously, institutions or buildings, so so um, it, you know, HE buildings have to be open during a certain part of the day, for example. But learning never stops, and it is about that anywhere, anytime learning. Um, I was classed as creative at school, um, which which we all know means um, rubbish. Um, but um, by that, I think when I look back on on the the tools that we have now, had they been available when I was at school, maybe the experience that I had. Um, then maybe it would have been different. Um, I may have excelled in subjects that I, I didn't excel in, um, but also it would have given me some of the skill sets that we're absolutely looking to empower our students, but actually not just students, by the way, um, staff as well. Um, and when we talk to employers now, 
whilst we are absolutely in no doubt the importance of the education system and, and what that comes with, employers are actually looking for skill sets that traditionally haven't always been able to be developed because of the way that the curriculum is delivered. And that's, by the way, not to say that the things are wrong, but if we can reevaluate those things and we can tap into those skills, we can um, actually have an uplift in, in knowledge retention. And there's a great report, um, a scientific report by uh, Fernandez, Wams and Mead that talk about learning through creativity. And just to highlight the um, the workflow that Matt showed with the, the what motivate sorry what motivates us slide that sketch noting is something that I would love to be able to do in the way that I see other people doing it because I actually realise that I would learn better from that. And so if we can tap in to uh, all of the learning patterns, and this is what comes from the report um, from. Um, from uh, Fernandez, Wams and Mead is that if we can tap into those motor neurons in those learning patterns, we're likely to have a 54% uplift in retention versus the tra traditional 24% of somebody standing at the front of a room talking at us and us maybe just writing down and going back to that point Matt highlighted. Um, if, you, if you do it differently and you can maybe draw something, you're likely to have a better retention because it's you're creating that content as your as your learning content. And so when we talk about creating that personalized learning content, it's always about also about the learning journey. Um, and going back to the Westminster um, study, sorry, the Westminster University, is actually some of those students who were accessing content late at night because they had a job to go to after the university hours and then they were able to learn actually were some of those students that performed better. And um, yes, we talk about, you know, well-being and when should we learn. And I know James, who introduced us at the beginning, will tell you that I probably should not work at some of the hours that I do. It's actually because it suits the way that I operate and it taps into the way that I know I get the best results out of myself. And so it's really important to look at those um, areas as part of that journey with a blended learning piece. And the workflow piece also looks around sustainability issues, which is a hot topic that may be not directly linked to the blending learning piece, but by moving into a solution that allows you to be in the cloud, allows you to give access to students, allows you to save money and all those sorts of things. It's a really important piece of, or a, a, a kind of an element of uh, the journey that absolutely needs to be considered. And the reality is, is the skill sets of those students where we can develop them in a different way means that those 65 percent of students that are likely to do a job that doesn't yet exist um, means that we can we can we can give morally and ethically additional um, tools to those students as well. And the employers are looking for those uh, particular sort of future workforce employees as a real uh, kind of strategic move into a way that they can develop their businesses and grow uh, and be sustainable as well. And so I guess from that perspective, um, it's really about looking at the quality of data that we have, not just only from staff, but students um, and the stakeholders, and really look at the positive impacts of technology and how do we implement those as a teaching and a learning tool or a learning and teaching tool um, and taking those steps forward. And, and that's the point of going back to that um, essential planning that I was talking about at the very beginning here um, and those leadership seminars is to look at those four key pillars, which are the strategy and the vision, the teaching, the learning, and ultimately the infrastructure and the environment that needs to happen for all of those things to come together to allow them to support the blended learning approach, which is um, which is really important. Um, and we can absolutely give you some information on those and we can share details of those workshops as well thereafter. And so I guess at that point, um, it's back to you, James, um, uh, and a big thank you from me, not only to uh, Mark from Apple, but absolutely, obviously, to, to Paul and Matt, um, and handing back to you, James. Don't worry, Tag, I'm here. Um, well, that was a lot of information. That was that was really cool. Like, I, I actually learned quite a lot myself in that one. So, um, because I know we're running over a little bit, we are going to allow some time for, for Q&A. Um, so, presenters, if you'd like to turn your cameras and mics on now, please. I know uh, I know Mark's got some bandwidth fun going on, so he'll probably just be on audio. Uh, Mark, are you there? Are you okay? I am, yeah. Hey, there we go. All right. So, um, if anybody would like to ask questions would like to do it now, there is a little bit of a delay between you guys and us, so it might take a minute for uh, for us to answer. Um, but I just wanted to kick off with one, actually, that Mark asked <laughs> while, uh, while Matt and Paul were presenting, because I think it's actually a really, uh, a really good point, is that um, it would be good to get your view on the need to be agile and how to adapt quickly if and when things change. I know you guys touched on it a little bit um, during your, your chat, but it would be really good to, to sort of expand on that 
that now, if you would. I'd say I'd say it's essential. I'd say that the the schools, colleges, universities that um, have <laughs> flourished in the last three months are those that had an opportunity to adapt very quickly. I know for one, um, you know, in in our course, the university we saw it coming um, because you know we were we were abreast of what was going on in the rest of the world, and we took time to train staff. Um, our benefit was that for the last four years, students have had technology in their hands um, and not in a in an external space. We we have always encouraged them to have technology, um, and in our case, it, it's iPad one to one, um, and that meant the second that they weren't on site, we knew exactly what devices they would have, what they had access to, what they were able to do with those things, and could support them from a distance. So that transition from um, the face-to-face -to, -face to an online world was was as seamless as it could have been, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> I would say it was perfect. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's a really good point though, because um, you know we've obviously have a, a lot of conversations with a lot of customers about how they're how they're dealing with this situation, how they've dealt with it, and and what their issues have been. And I think it's fairly safe to say what you found or what we found is when someone's already had a baseline of technology in place leveraging and adapting that technology to a new scenario is a lot easier than trying to do it all from scratch. I mean, that sounds like an obvious statement, but I think the point is, even if you've only, as, a, as an organization, used technology as a, a supplementary thing in terms of your, your teaching and learning workflow, and now it needs to be a lot bigger, because it's there in the first place, what you're doing is tweaking something that already exists and reconfiguring mm. it, as opposed to having to go from, from scratch, which is a lot harder to do. I think you know, every everybody in this call can probably attest to the fact that the first time you put new technology into a teaching and learning environment where it hasn't been used, that's where it doesn't. It, I'm not saying it doesn't go smoothly, but there's a big change, like a mental change, uh, a routine change, a curriculum change that kind of needs to happen to to leverage that. But once you pass that that hump, I don't want to call it a barrier because it's not. It's just a, a mm. you know a, a bit of a, a mindset change. Um, you can then do anything with that technology. Um, I know Paul and I especially have had lots of conversations um, after various events and things we've done about this kind of stuff. But I think the, um, to Matt, to your point about, you know, you, it was relatively seamless, your change. I would be willing to bet there were probably a lot of changes that were going on in terms of how you use the technology um, as opposed to it not being there in the first place, right? Is that, is that a fair point, I guess? Well, I, I would say for one instance, um, the week that we went into lockdown, uh, my students were due to do a formal presentation assessment. Um, and in the two days, we had to change the assessment so that it could still take place at the same time. And it just moved to just do it online, do it as a, a voiceover of your presentation. Um, and it took a two, three minute video to show them how screen recording works on the iPad for yeah. them to move from I, I now can't present in person, but I can actually still present with my voice using the slides and the, the assessment took place at exactly the same time as it would have done. So had that not been in the case, we'd have had to have completely redesigned assessment to, to fulfill the needs of the course. We didn't, we, we just adapted it. Um, and yes, there were some hiccups with some of the students needing a little bit of extra help. But like we said, the transition was a lot easier because the technology was there to support us to do it. Yeah, um, perfect. I, th I think uh, I, I'd just like to kind of uh, reinforce what both of you have said, and, and uh, also say actually the invest the the introduction of technology is simply bringing in the technology is actually probably the easiest thing to do. Yeah, the hardest thing to do, as Tom and Matt and James and I know, the hardest thing is strategically planning for it. And then once it's in place and is driven by purpose, what what is the reason? Uh, I, I, I've just messaged Matt and said, I can't believe we got through our presentation without talking about Simon Sinek. <laughs> and yet here we are, because it's, it's why. why. Why are we relying on technology? Why do we need the technology? Uh, and the easiest part is, OK, well, let's get the technology in. Uh, and as, as Matt kind of alluded to there, it's, it's also thinking that the, the agility uh, really depends on the culture within an institution and, uh, and on the professional and personal readiness to adapt as well. Uh, that you know, We could be talking about your know, different mindsets, about growth mindsets and opening closed minds. 
but I'm going to breathe in because Tom's got his hand in the air. Uh, just, other than that, he's just waving. It might be. Uh, Ta-da! <laughs> uh, uh, just on that, that Simon Sinek, obviously, Paul, we, we talk about the why. Actually, there's, a, there's an even deeper version of, of the why from Simon Sinek, and it's the just cause. And we can talk about that being a little bit fluffy, but actually um, it's really important. Actually, the, the why is, is an element of that, but actually what is the just cause of that why? And actually, we can get an even deeper understanding or, or, or somebody else can get an even deeper understanding of that drive to move that step forward. Um, and it's, it's absolutely worth that discussion point um, when, when you're planning. And, yeah, I think and, the, the... Sorry, go on, Paul. Uh, no, I was just about to say, and anyone listening, Tom is absolutely the right person to, to engage with and, and facilitate that process. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on a point that you made uh, a couple of minutes ago, Paul, about the, the technology itself is actually the easy bit, which is, you know, normally you wouldn't you wouldn't think that you've got to put a bunch of devices or a bunch of new tech into into an institute or an organization. And it, it, you know, it's not simple. But if you compare it to the journey that that organization has to go on to then use that technology, even if we're talking about um, uh, consultancy, strategic planning workshops, planning essentials, all of that kind of stuff. We can wrap up the majority of requirements for the tech being deployed in the technological environment within like a day. There may be some follow-up questions. There may be a couple of other bits. And it's a fairly standard. We know that every environment we put this tech into is going to have a lot of similarities. And we can, you know, we can basically assume a lot of things are the case. And then deploying the stuff, a lot of it is the, the time it takes, or the majority of the time it takes, is actually the physical aspect of handing stuff out, not necessarily the configuration or the deployment. But then you look at what happens with strategic planning workshops and planning essentials, and you have, yeah, you've got you know a day or two of, of those in the first place, but then the seismic shift that has to happen in the organization to then go and apply that contextually and then plan around it and then do all of the various prerequisites before you even get to the point of touching a device. <laughs> it's, it's, such a, it's such an important thing, and I think it's hugely overlooked that, that people assume the tech is going to be the hard bit but actually the, the mentality, the methodology, and the application is the, the bit that's going to take a lot more time. Right? And, and, and maybe, Matt, the reason you were able to move so smoothly and briskly, uh, and coming back to Mark's thing about agility, maybe it is because of, of that mindset of readiness? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Saying I've got a mindset of readiness makes me sound really intelligent, so I'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> just, Paul, just, that. just to that, that point, it's, it's Mark here. We, we often talk about point and pathway. And, and when, you, when you look back, uh, things that have, have happened successfully, it's, it's often because people have been able to circle around a point or a purpose. And I suppose yeah. that's what we were describing yesterday. So is, is, is there a point, is, is that point a priority that a group of people are going to get around? And then, James, I, I, I think yeah, you've, you've then described the pathway. And, mm. and I think sometimes people get that back to front or sometimes even miss the point. They go and, go and walk on a pathway. But when s stuff then starts to get slightly difficult, uh, then you need to go back to your point. What, what was the reason for us doing this? And I think that's the thing that brings the brings the people and it brings the project back to, together again. Mm. But uh, I think... So I, I, would, I would always go back to those two points, excuse the, uh, the dub, dub, double yeah. use of point, but it's <laughs> what, what is the point or what's the purpose? And, 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 and think... then what's the, what's the clear pathway that we can walk down to go and get there? And I think just on that, Mark, actually, and, and just was highlighting what, what, what James said, was um, if, if, if we can, the biggest barrier is often the fear of change. Um, the problem is, is going back to that point, if we're always doing the same thing and it, it and then we can't see the light in the tunnel or it suddenly becomes difficult. The easy thing is to A, blame the technology and B, yeah. go, you know what, I'm not doing it. And and that's that's the problem of the old methodology of we're going to buy all of these devices. And when they're sitting there on the desk, we're going to go, oh, we've got these now. How do we well, how are we going to use them? And actually, they become they become not a conversation point because if you have that plan, you have that journey, and you can see um, th th those points that you're talking about, Mark, is in the the devices fits into that rather yeah. than the opposite way around, which is where that mindset thing goes back, and that's that holistic approach. Is that and journey? And Paul and I talk about it. That journey is never linear; it's always always ongoing. Yeah. When you get to the first measurement of success, 
you're then looking at the second one, which you knew was coming because you've delivered on the first bit and you carry on that journey. So absolutely agree. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think we've said this a, a number of times as well, is that the device is almost kind of the last bit of consideration because you have to figure out what you want to achieve first, and that's a big task. You then have to uh, figure out how you then want to apply what you want to achieve, which is also a big task. And then you've got the conversation of, right, we want to achieve this in this way. So then you're looking at actually is a tablet better or is a notebook better? Are you going to talk iPad or are you going to talk MacBook Air, for example? But we've had lots of customers that have just gone, I want iPad or I want MacBook Air, or I want this. And then you have to try and fit the learning around the device when actually the device should be the enabler. And you can't figure out what needs to be the enabler until you know what you want to achieve. So it's, it's just, it's so important to make sure this, this path is followed, basically. I'm, and I'm that, passionate about it. And James, actually, that, that absolutely mirrors what Mark was just saying about point and pathway. Yeah. That for many people, uh, sometimes the point is the device. Yeah. And we think, no. The device is a pathway. What's the point? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I'm, I'm cool. off, to, off to stroke my virtual beard. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got one now. I can I can do that. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. I think uh, so. There's not any more questions coming in, which is I think we've covered so much. We've probably pre-answered most people's questions, especially especially Paul and Matt. So, um, guys, just before we close off, I don't know if there's anything else any of you guys wanted to add. Anything you you didn't say that you want to make sure we make a point about? That's a that's a dangerous thing to allow me and Paul. I know time. it is. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Mutal. <laughs> no, I will been, take that as a no. No, good, excellent. It's been been some really good content, guys. So thank you very much for that. Um, so on that note, then we're gonna we're gonna close off. Um, we're gonna hang around in chat, uh, presenters. If you could all just stick around for a couple of minutes while we put the uh, the outro video on. If there's anything you wanted to ask that you uh, you didn't ask during the webinar, then please do so now. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Cheers. <laughs>